Well, welcome to our, our webinar on NRCS and high tunnel systems. Now, this is a topic that has generated a lot of interest here in North Dakota. When we had our high tunnel conference last time, uh, we just had a line of people trying to talk to the NRCS and the Farm Service Agency. So we're glad that they're, they're, they've come back to answer some more questions for our stakeholders. But joining us today, we have Josh Munson, who is the District Conservationist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services. And uh, our, our second presenter today will be Lindsay Abentroth with the USDA Farm Service Agency. Uh, so welcome to both of you today, and, and thank you for agreeing to present. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to present today. So go ahead. All right. So my name is Josh Munson. I'm the district conservationist here for the NRCS office in Fargo. So that means I cover Cass County. So everything that I'm talking about is kind of a generalization from my, my field office level. Make sure that you go and you talk with your local district conservationist, soil conservationist. In one Okay, I appear to be muted there for a second, so I believe I'm back on task. So be sure to visit your local NRCS office and FSA offices, and they can further provide you with some clarification based on their personal experiences on all of these. Here's just a quick video with kind of an overview of the NRCS high tunnels. And during the run through, things work totally fine, but now today we're on the cusp of getting everything done. So it likes to throw a little Allen wrench in there for us. So we'll try and get this run up and running here in just one moment. say farmers are discovering the benefits of high tunnel systems. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service can help with both technical and financial assistance to integrate high tunnels into your farming operation. While they may look like greenhouses, high tunnels are actually quite different. Greenhouses are usually constructed of glass and metal with seeds or plants grown in pots. High tunnels are polyethylene, plastic, or fabric enclosed structures built over hoops, and they can be assembled for a fraction of the cost. Because of their lightweight modular construction, high tunnels are easy to assemble and often easy to move. This benefits a variety of crops, from plants to trees, growing directly in the ground or in raised beds. Having greater climate control allows farmers to improve plant health. They can protect their crops from weather extremes, poor air quality, wind, and other damaging effects. They can also grow crops earlier in the spring and later into the winter months, and sometimes year-round. And they offer farmers a greater ability to manage pests and even drift from pesticides and pollen. These farms prevent direct rainfall from reaching plants. Farmers can use precision tools like drip irrigation to efficiently deliver both water and nutrients. High tunnels can also provide farmers with a number of tools, including the use of cover crops that are from rotation practice. This can help prevent erosion, suppress weeds, increase soil water content, and break pest cycles. In their continuing effort to help improve the effectiveness of high tunnels, NRCS also supports scientists unlocking the secrets of cover crops, using laboratory testing to reveal even greater soil fertility benefits. But perhaps the best thing about high tunnels is that they help farmers furnish their communities with more diverse local crops, reducing energy and transportation costs providing their communities with greater food security. 
To learn more about NRCS assistance with high tunnels, visit your local NRCS field office or nrcs.usda.gov. NRCS, helping you help the land. All right, now I'll try and advance the slides here. <clears throat> okay, so NRCS is here to try and address the resource concerns. A lot of them that we address here are things such as erosion, water quality, et cetera. There's a wide variety of what we call conservation practices. For high tunnels, that's what we're going to be addressing, plant productivity and health. That's the resource concern that we, we file that under. <clears throat> so the eligibility is, it has to be land that's currently capable of producing crops, um, most likely under cultivation currently. We couldn't have an area where, say there used to be an old barn or other building and things like that, and there's concrete, and it's not necessarily available to be planted right now, you would all need to be kind of cleaned up and prepped and ready to actually produce crops in order for that land to be eligible. Um, this does not apply to crops not grown in the natural soil profile. So the raised beds are limited to 12 inches in depth, and then no pots, tables, or hydroponics or anything. So that's one thing where we have to utilize the natural soil there. There can definitely be some series of amendments, such as composting and things like that to help increase the soil fertility. But those are, those need to be grown in the natural soil profile. Um, it needs to be constructed in accordance with the manufacturer's uh, recommendations. That's one of the big important things for us because there's such a variety of um, manufacturers out there. We wanna try and utilize their, their knowledge and their proper manufacturing specs on those things. So we need to have at least six feet high at the peak so it's got some height to it, and the covering needs to be a four-year minimum lifespan of the six millimeter greenhouse grade UV resistant material. <clears throat> As we've all been aware here in this area, snow loads can damage the structure. So at the end of the growing season, unless the structure is designed to withstand the snow loads, we need to take and roll up and then properly store the, the poly and everything at the end of the year. If it has a two out of five year irrigation history, the micro irrigation could possibly be eligible as a practice with us also, but we need good clear documentation to show that it had been irrigated in, in the manner. If it was all just dry land and when the rain came, it came kind of thing, then it likely wouldn't meet the irrigation history for that practice. And all of, with this particular practice that we're looking at, it would have to have a lifespan of four years and within that building, we gotta make sure we're not providing any shelter or housing to any sort of livestock or storing equipment and supplies. We can't be parking our tractors under there. We gotta make sure it's just used for the production of agricultural crops. Um, we can't be installing on slopes greater than 5%. Here in, in Cass County, at least, this really shouldn't be a problem in most cases as we're a pretty flat land area, but all across the US or other individuals that are listening in, that could definitely come in come into play for you. <clears throat> because of my personal experience in this part of the country, I would probably suggest purchasing a system that can withstand the higher wind speeds. I've seen all across the state some very strong winds that are able to kind of tear things apart. And if you can spend a little bit extra investment in trying to provide extra rigidity and strength to your structure, I think it would definitely be, be worth it versus the damage that could potentially come in the long run. Another thing to consider is potential shading next to uh, other tall structures and trees and things like that. So we'd like to try and plan to build it two times the height of whatever that shading um, item could be there. As we know, the high tunnels do shed a large amount of water. So 
one thing that I've had success with is maybe suggesting a quick growing cover crop, such as a cereal rye, just on the outside where things were kind of disturbed during the construction of the high tunnel that would take, put a nice solid mat and help reduce the erosion and things on the outside of the structure as the water is shedding off the top of it. Um, we also kind of consider say 10 to 20 feet, depending on your snow removal items and stuff like that. And it also gives you a little bit of room if you're installing them next to each other for the cover to be installed. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that we're putting it in a proper location and we're not going to create any additional resource concerns, particularly with water erosion. So we sit there and we make sure we go out to the site where we're going to be building it and we try and look at all those different considerations and factors going, hey, we have some buildings here, the shading here, we have maybe a highly erodible soil, so we got to make sure we're putting some cover on there because we don't want that to be water to be running off, taking the soil with it and look at the slope and everything in certain cases. And so there's a lot of things that we try and sit down and work with you on a plan, plan basis for. And these are just a couple of the soil health tenants that I like, like you to kind of consider, such as minimizing soil disturbance, um, planting diversity within the crop, trying to keep a living root in the soil as long as we can around the year, because that's what's really helping drive the microbiology and the soil function in that. Keeping it covered with residue is something we've covered, particularly for erosion. And I kind of made note that a lot of gardens are tilled excessively each year, and this can lead to multiple imbalances in the natural soil biota to lead to issues down the road. That's when those diseases can start coming up because we think of it more as a food, uh, soil food web instead of more the food chain. And trying to work within all of those soil health tenants should set you up for success. So, and here are some of the different categories that individuals might fall into if, and affect how we get the financial assistance to you. Um, we have a beginning farmer or rancher, and that is essentially, they have not operated a farmer ranch or who has operated a farmer ranch for not more than 10 consecutive years. So that is something to consider if, if you're newly getting into this, and I have a feeling a lot of the individuals I spoke with at the conference would could possibly fall into that. Another is limited resource uh, farmer rancher. And this one, A, when it talks about the gross farm sales of less than $174,600, yeah, we could, there's probably a lot of folks that would be falling into that. But the second part might be a little bit tougher and based on the current fiscal year 2018, that would be showing that your uh, total household income would be less than $28,000. $941. So that might be something to consider if you're looking at trying to go into that category. And that's total income and uh, not just from farm and ranch? <clears throat> yes, total household income. So if you have a, a second um, primary job that in the household and your household income is above that, then that, that would not be falling under this category. We good? Yes, okay. sorry. <laughs> no, nope, just wanted to verify. Um, <clears throat> for veteran farmer or rancher, you would be a veteran that was released um, under the condition other than dishonorable and who also would meet the criteria of the farmer or rancher, having the 10 years, less than 10 years of farming ranching experience. The socially disadvantaged group, um, would be subject to ra racial or ethnic prejudice because of their identity as a member of a group without regard to their individual qualities. And those groups include African Americans, American Indians, or Alaska Natives, Hispanics, and Asians or Pacific Islanders. So if that's also a potential group that someone would fall into, there's also a different rate for financial assistance there. So I just wanted to make sure that I pointed this out that these are the fiscal year 2018, which we are currently in, that started October 1st, and we're currently contracting at these rates. So in the future, they, the rates could change, and I have no set knowledge of what they could possibly be, so I just wanted to make sure individuals are aware of that. And I also wanted to make sure everyone knows that we provide financial assistance. It's not a grant program, and it's not technically cost share, 
it's just a rate per square foot. A grant is, you know, totally different. And the cost share, we just, we pay a set rate. It could be almost all the cost of it financially for you. It could be a very small amount of cost based on the manufacturer and what you pay and what the insulation and construction of it is. So the traditional right now for somebody could be as low as 241 or the snow Gothic, which has a peak that can withstand snow loads much better and shed snow better. That's up to 462. And we have a payment cap of $7,600. So that would mean we could cost, I'm sorry, financial assistance on anywhere from 3,153 square feet, if it was at the traditional Quonset, or down as low as 1645. And that's where the payment cap would come in. So those might be something also to consider when going about this. <clears throat> and these are the examples of the Gothic on the left. It sheds the snow much better and can withstand the snow loads a little bit. And we got a Quonset and the failed structure in the bottom right to show when the snow piles up on it. Yeah, we probably, probably shouldn't have that up there still. <clears throat> so obviously there's an operations and maintenance we want to do throughout the life, lifespan of it. Small tears and things like that need to be repaired. If some, something breaks, reinstalled, because these do have a four-year lifespan. Closing the sides and things like that before the big storm event so that air doesn't take lift and try and pull and rip on that structure. Um, I would also probably suggest in most cases, because of where we're at, removing the cover prior to winter and then finding a good safe storage space for it. So that way it's not just sitting out in the back of the yard or sitting over by something where we get big winter winds and picks it up and, well, I tossed a couple of bricks on there and then we have a damaged um, cover and you have to replace it the next year. So if there's something where there's serious risk of collapse, we're also in a, say a late or early winter storm kind of comes in, it might be worth just going out there and slashing your plastic in order to prevent it from failure. Because then you could, you could save the framework at least, and that's gonna be where the most of the costs and things are at there. And doing, performing soil tests to monitor the nutrients and salt buildups, I would maybe consider getting a water quality test if you can. I believe NDSU um, does provide those things. Because if you're constantly adding a lot of salts and things from a well source possibly, that, that could begin making it much more difficult for the crops in there. So that's another reason maybe why leaving it open for a full season and moving it if you have another area that you possibly can, or just allowing the snow to pile up over the winter. And then hopefully as the snow melts, it'll hopefully move a little bit of that, those saltier uh, salts down through the soil profile. And eventually we hope to get out of the soil root zone. I would also maybe consider on the outside after we get something quickly established during that year of construction, consider maybe a perennial pollinator mix or something that could be good. It not only would look really nice after it's established, but it can actually improve the pollination of the crops as well. And NRCS is always there to try and help you with that based on your soils. We can always suggest native pollinators and things like that. Soil Conservation District also does a lot with the urban program and they, they've done a lot of good things with pollinators as well. So at the end of the proper use of the life of the plastic, that's another thing we wanna try and make sure that we have a proper disposal of it. We don't wanna just kinda of take and throw that away you could probably look at going into a recycling center of some kind, talking with your local landfills and things of that nature. And with that, I will now turn it over to Laura. Thank you all very much. Hello everyone. My name is Lindsay Abentroth and I'm the Public Affairs and Outreach Coordinator for North Dakota Farm Service Agency. And um, we're very happy to be with you all today. Um, I am joined along with several FSA program directors and specialists. Um, but just to start out, I wanted to let you guys all know what the Farm Service Agency is and what it's all about. Um, the Farm Service Agency is an agency within the United States Department of Agriculture. And our mission is to help farmers and ranchers 
secure the greatest possible benefit from programs administered by FSA, such as farm loans, commodity price support, disaster relief, conservation, and other available resources, including and not limiting to helping producers who are interested and engaged in high tunnel agriculture production. So as I mentioned, there are several program directors that specialize in certain farm service agency areas with me today. And uh, they are all going to speak with you about the programs that they administer here for North Dakota Farm Service Agency. Um, first up, we're gonna have Laura Heinrich. She's a production adjustment division, and she's gonna go over producer eligibility, um, non-insured assistance program, our organic certification cost share program, and also some FSA communication opportunities. Uh, we also have Ryan Limbaum with us today our, from our Farm Loan Division, and he's going to give you a general FSA Farm Loan Program Overview. And finally, we have Brian Haugen with us from the Price Support Division, who is going to be covering farm storage facility loan programs. So I am going to turn it over to Laura Heinrich. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I am Laura Heinrich and I'm with the Farm Service Agency in the Production Adjustment Division. And first of all, I'm gonna cover with you just some program eligibility. Um, to qualify for some of our programs, whether it's with um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service for their EQIP program that Josh just covered, or any of the programs that we'll be covering um, with you from the Farm Service Agency standpoint, um, producers have to meet certain um, eligibility requirements. Um, the first thing they need to do is be associated with a farm and tract. And what that means is that you're gonna to need to contact your local farm service agency office and indicate on a map uh, exactly where you're putting that high tunnel. Um, and once you indicated that, we will go into our system, um, draw out that area on, in our um, GIS system in the, and indicate that you are the operator of that land. And that's how we associate that farm and tract with you. Um, and then once we do that, then you also have to meet some additional eligibility requirements based on the specific program. If that particular program um, has a payment limitation requirement, um, we'll need to ask you some questions to determine um, the direct how we're gonna directly attribute those payments to either the person or the legal entity. So we'll have you fill out uh, a form giving us information about your farming operation. Um, the other criteria you'd have to be is meet the foreign person rule, which basically, um, if you're a foreign person, uh, you need to have a resident green card. And then we'll also need to indicate whether you're a minor child or not, because um, there's specific rules that are associated with my, minor children and program benefits. If the program you're applying for has a conservation compliance, where um, you must certify that you're in compliance with a highly erodible land um, provisions uh, or a wetland um, provisions. You'll need to complete a form, it's called an AD 1026, and that's also ap applicable to NRCS programs that Josh just covered also. If the program you're applying for has an adjusted gross income um, eligibility requirement, we'd have you fill out an average adjusted gross income certification. That's the form CCC 941. And on that particular form, you're just going to certify whether your average adjusted gross income is less than $900,000 or not. And to determine that, we look at the three years prior to the year preceding the year re that you're requesting benefits for. So that's the basic eligibility requirements for the for different USDA programs. Um, there's a couple programs that I administer that I'd like to cover with you that would be interest to a lot of um, fruit and vegetable producers. The first um, program is the non-insured assistance program. Um, NAP is intended, or NAP, because we use a lot of acronyms with with the government, as you can tell. Um, NAP is intended to reduce financial losses that occur when natural disasters cause a catastrophic loss of an eligible crop. And those el an eligible crop is a commercial um, agricultural crop for which federal crop insurance is not available. 
So in North Dakota, most of our crops are that are covered under NAP would be fruit and vegetables or um, forage crops. And as we discussed earlier, some programs have a payment limitation. This particular program does, and it has a $125,000 payment limitation. So what kind of coverage level do we offer under this program? Um, we have two options. The first option is basic coverage. Um, with that, the coverage is available at 50% of the producer's established yield at 55% of the established price. Um, and with that, there is a service fee of $250 per crop. So under basic coverage, just to give an example of how a payment would work, is if the producer established a yield of 100, um, 100 weight per acre for that particular crop, NAP would guarantee 50% of that 100 hundred weight or 50 hundred weight per acre. If the crop only produced 20 hundred weight due, be, due to drought or um, hail, then FSA would make a payment to the producer for, the thir for 30 hundred weight times 55% of the price. So that 30 hundred weight is the difference between the guarantee of 50 hundred weight per acre and what they actually produced of the 20. The other coverage option is buy-up coverage. Um, with that particular coverage, the producer can select anywhere from 50 to 65% of the established yield at 100% of the price. Again, there is a service fee associated with that, plus there's also a premium of 5.25%. As Josh indicated with his programs, um, we do have a uh, Additional benefits for producers who meet um, a beginning farmer, um, limited resource or targeted underserved, um, or is a targeted underserved producer. We would, with, if they meet one of those criteria, we would waive that $250 per crop service fee. And then we'd also reduce, if they chose to do buy-up, we'd reduce the premium by 50%. And there is a service fee maximum of $750 per producer um, per administrative county. So if you were produce, if you were insuring four crops, um, you'd only have to pay $750 instead of $1,000. The other program um, I administer that you may be interested in is the Organic Certification Cost Share Program. Um, this program offsets um, the cost of certification of becoming or an organic producer. Um, it reimburses organic producers and handlers as much as 75% of the cost of the organic certification and up to a maximum of $750 annually per certification category, such as crops, livestock, uh, wild crops, and handling or handling and processing. Um, with this program, um, the North Dakota Department of Agriculture also assists us in um, administering this program. So county offices can either or producers can either contact um, the North Dakota Department of Agriculture to apply for the cost share assistance or um, their local FSA office. If you have any further questions um, on the programs I just covered, you can contact myself um, or Wanda Brayton um, for eligibility questions. So Ryan Limbaum's going to be up next to discuss farm loan programs. Uh, my name is Ryan Limbaum and I'm the farm loan director for the state of North Dakota. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, farm loan programs available for FSA. Uh, this is uh, not just a North Dakota program, it's a nationwide program available in all states, including, you know, like for example, Minnesota or South Dakota. Uh, so basically we offer, uh, we offer two kinds of loan programs, a direct and a guaranteed loan program. Uh, the direct, basically you work with your local FSA office and the guaranteed program, you work with your local bank. Uh, the difference is with your local bank, we will offer up to a 90% guarantee. So for example, let's say you borrow $100,000 the bank's actually only risking $10,000 because we're guaranteeing up to $90,000 to the bank. Uh, the main point is though, we do not compete with private commercial credit. So this is basically for those producers that can't or are unable to obtain credit. 
but we do uh, place a special emphasis for beginning farmers or minority or women farmers or ranchers. Uh, you know, since we're talking high tunnels, one of our most popular programs in North Dakota for like high tunnels, which we've done a few throughout the state, is the microloan program, uh, where you could borrow up to fifty thousand dollars to basically, you know, do the build a high tunnel, for example. And so, like the question always arises: Are nurseries or vegetable starts or greenhouse operations eligible? And the answer is yes, they are eligible for uh, the microloan program, or even like certain, you know. Farmers markets or CSAs are, you know, you can use the microloan program. Uh, in North Dakota, here's our contact numbers for our uh, direct loan program. And so if you want to contact, you know, for the other states, whether you're in Minnesota or South Dakota, just contact your local FSA office and they, they should give you the information for farm loans. Okay, so our farm loans, uh, obviously here's the microloan uh, program. You can borrow up to fifty thousand uh, dollars. Loan can be used for initial startup expenses, or you know, buy seed, you know, supplies, etc. Or you can build a high tunnel. And the term uh, depends on the project, obviously, but it, usually the typical term is one to seven-year term. Uh, other loan programs we do have available: uh, the guaranteed operating, you know, through your local bank. You can borrow up to one point three nine nine million. We also have a land contract guaranteed program uh, for 500,000. And we also do offer a youth loan program. Uh, typically that's 10 to 20 years of age and they're working with like their local FFA or 4-H group. And so that is another popular program. Uh, we do have also a direct farm ownership loan where you can borrow up to $300,000 and usually that terms up to 40 years. We have a beginning farmer down payment program. Uh, typically the producer would have to provide 5% down, uh, but they do get a lower interest rate. Uh, typically it's a fixed 1.5% interest rate and the max they could borrow there is 300,000. We have a direct operating program. Uh, let's say for example, you wanna build a high tunnel structure that's over $50,000 for instance, you could use the direct operating program. You can borrow up to 300,000 and it's a one to seven year term typically. And we do have an emergency loan program for crop losses or physical losses, and that's up to 500,000. And typically that loan program depends on what your loss is. And also we do have a guaranteed farm ownership loan where you can borrow up to 1.399 million. And the difference between the direct and the guaranteed interest rates are with the direct uh, FSA loan, you basically pay the, the direct loan rate, which is typically fixed. With the guaranteed loan, you basically borrow what the bank would charge. We don't set up the bank. Basically, they have to charge the same average interest rate to all producers. And so I'll turn it over now to Mr. Brian Hogan to talk about the farm storage facility loan. Yes, as Ryan stated, uh, I'm Brian Haugen from our Price Support Division here with FSA. Um, I want to talk about the Farm Storage Facility Loan Program. Um, unlike some of the prior presentations where the discussion was for financial assistance for high tunnels for the production of fruit and vegetables, uh, the Facility Loan Program does not provide uh, financing for the production uh, of those crops. But what the program does offer financial assistance for is for um, post-harvest, which would be for structures for the storage of fruit and vegetables, the handling, and the transportation. Uh, the FSFL program has been very popular with our grain producers, um, pulse crop oilseed producers, and in addition to that, it also has eligibility for uh, fruit and vegetable producers uh, as well. What that would entail uh, as far as storage structures um, to provide uh, cold storage for the storing uh, of the crops once that they've been harvested. Uh, and this would be um, cooling equipment in addition to there being uh, 
handling trucks for the transportation uh, of the product, uh, which would be uh, refrigerated uh, units. The facility loan program, uh, we have a chart that just identifies the different loan amounts. Uh, the maximum loan amount is up to 500,000. However, there's no limit on the number of $500,000 loans uh, an individual may have. We've also included as far as the referenced required down payment amounts and based on the loan amounts, whether the equipment that is being purchased for um, the storage or handling um, of the fruits and vegetables, whether they're new or used. And then the terms uh, are listed at the bottom of this slide, which are all derived based on uh, the loan amount will determine uh, the loan terms. Some summary of some of the items related to the facility loan program. Again, a program post harvest for storage handling and transportation of fruit and vegetables. The interest rate that applicable based on the term that is a locked in term for the term of the loan. Um, and that is determined based on the month in which uh, the loan is approved. And we've included on this slide, if you had a loan that was approved uh, here in the month of February, what that interest rate would be uh, for the loan term. Our program does uh, charge a non-refundable $100 application fee. And in addition to that, some other general eligibility requirements that uh, one individual loan or aggregate loan amount, once we exceed the $100,000 threshold, they do require additional security, either in the form of real estate or uh, a letter of credit. And then also for the facility loan program, um, with the exception of handling equipment or handling trucks, uh, any st uh, structure for storage, uh, there would have to be an eligibility means test completed to determine a storage need. And then also one uh, final reminder, as far as any of the new equipment, handling equipment, handling trucks uh, that are uh, to be applied for under this program, uh, we need to be reminded that those items cannot be purchased prior to the loan application uh, being approved by the local county committee. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it back over to Lindsay. All right, everybody, um, we just wanna leave you with some contact information to find out more uh, detailed program information on everything that we covered today. Um, you can certainly visit www.fsa.usda.gov. Also, we have a lot of fact sheets out there and um, there's a couple of links right here where you can go to, to, again, get some more detailed information on everything we discussed with you today. Um, also, we wanted to point out that um, these, this is a map of all of our service centers in North Dakota, and I'm realizing that it um, isn't turning out real clear here, but um, in almost every single county in North Dakota, with the exception of um, to, I believe, Billings and Slope County, we have an FSA service center. So we would encourage you to stop in there for any information and those folks would be happy to visit with you about um, any FSA program related information that you wanna discuss with them. And also there's a link at the bottom too where you can see, get the actual contact information. You can get the phone number and the address of all of the county service centers in North Dakota. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch on today is just to keep up to date with uh, FSA information, I would encourage you to sign up for our state um, and county newsletters. Um, this is a, a sheet that will provide you with information on how to subscribe to receive that. Um, it's all timely um, and good information uh, that you'll get on a monthly basis on what's going on in the FSA world. Um, we also have an SMS text messaging service, so you can opt in to receive uh, text messages from every county in North Dakota. And and um, we assure you that we won't bog you down with um, more than two text messages a month and it, it'll all be timely and important information on dates and deadlines um, that you would want to receive. 
And so that wraps up the FSA portion um, and our webinar portion today, but I believe now we are going to open it up for questions um, from the NRCS side of things and also from the FSA side of things. As I mentioned before, we have many different program specialists and knowledge in the room here, so we'll do our best to answer any questions that you may have. Lindsay, this is Esther. Would you send me those websites so I can then send it to our entire High Tunnel listserv? Absolutely. I would be happy to do that, Esther. Thank you. And this is, this is our opportunity for questions. <clears throat> Esther, we'll, I'll send you a copy of the presentation with all the embedded links. And that okay. Individuals can also have that. I apologize for not getting that to you earlier for individuals to follow along. So we, we'll get that to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Josh. <clears throat> All right, so if any of you have questions, go ahead and uh, ask them. Um, you can certainly type it in the chat box if you don't have a microphone. So I am unmuting all of you, so you'll be able to ask questions. And I hear people typing. I've got a quick question for you. This is Drew Imes out here in Williston. Uh, I'm just uh, a little bit away from the uh, SU Experiment Station out here at Hoffland, uh, East of Wilson. Uh, part of my Master Gardener work, I will be working with uh, you, uh, FFA 4 a those kinds of kids. I am fortunate enough to have some acreage out here. And one of the things occurred to me, there very well may be excess acreage out here. Uh, can some of these people, if they're interested in coming down here, we've got good soil, we've got access to water. Uh, both rural water and well water, uh, is it possible for them to finance on somebody else's land if a group of them want to do this? Did you get that? Yeah, this is Ryan Lindbaum from uh, for Farm Loans. Yeah, basically we could uh, finance on other people's land. The, the main point is we need a uh, you know, a lease agreement of some sort, you know, for the term of the loan. You know, so if you're doing, let's say, a five-year uh, high tunnel, we would need a five-year lease on the land. That, that, uh, that answers my question exactly, because I'm very busy right here, but part of the master gardening, uh, uh, working with the youth is one of the key areas I have, and this is affordable. If you help with fundraisers and all that, learn about growing, safe handling, all that other stuff. So thank you very kindly. All right, other questions? And while people are typing, maybe I'll ask a question about the facilities loan. Um, is the facilities loan going to be very similar to the um, to the other loans where there would be priority given to minorities and women, or do you ha um, are those that have a, a lower income, or is that open to everybody? It would be open to everyone. There would be no priority ranking based on um, individuals with limited resources and so forth. Every it would be open to everyone. In addition to that. Uh, there's not a ranking system based on the applications, it's based on eligibility, eligibility and security requirements being met. Is everybody being shy? Sorry. 
Any other question? Any other questions here? Well, while you're thinking, maybe I'll ask Josh a question. Josh, is there a certain, or is there a limited uh, pool of money that's available this year for equip loans or for for financial assistance? Yes, there's a certain amount of money set aside each year for those, and there could actually be a couple different pools. A high tunnel or limited resource and beginning farmer, there would be two separate pools for each of those. And depending on what category they fall into, if they are a long-term farmer that would not fall under any of the historically underserved groups, then they would just go under the high tunnel systems. So they're, they're set aside money each year and it varies every single year. So for the most part, we've had great success in funding high tunnel. Oh, wow. Now, is it possible that you could ex you could use up your whole pool of money before um, before September? Well, right now we're we've already addressed. We started with our 2018. So this summer we would like to be going out and visiting with the producers on their operation, looking at at the eligibility, doing our on-site visit, looking for those resource concerns, and addressing those with the high tunnel. And they would be in for the 2019 fiscal year, which would start October 1st. Of 2018? Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't go by calendar year, we go by fiscal year. So what influences how much you get per year? Is there a certain calculation um, that affects the pool that's available for North Dakota? It, it's all distributed out through uh, Washington, D.C. So they, they allot certain amounts for the states and they divvy it up appropriately based on interest and historic number of contracts and things like that. So if we have more and more interest, our pool would grow then too? I, I would imagine the more and more interest and success, we would likely see additional funds. Like I said, at this point, I've, I've seen very good success rates of getting them funded. Right, I see a question from Rachel Saylor. Um, oh, oh I see here. Well, I guess this one isn't for uh, for Josh. Okay. So, any other questions? And yes, Rachel, I can add you to the listserv. Yes, absolutely. And if anybody has. Uh, knows of anybody else that would like to be on the listserv, you can certainly contact me and I will add you. Well, if that's all, I really appreciate the opportunity to allow FSA and NRCS to present this information to you and we look forward to working with you in the future. And thank you to everybody for tuning in today. We had a nice, uh, a nice crowd of participants, and we'll also be recording this. I am a little behind in getting the recordings uh, posted on the website, but I hope to catch up here with uh, sometime in the next week. So we'll make this recording available on our website so that other people can can use the important information that you've shared with us. So thank you very much to NRCS and to Farm Service Agency for letting us know what resources are available. All right. Thank you. Have and then our, our next, our next um, high tunnel webinar actually alludes to something that Josh had talked about, about the buildup of salts in our soils. So our next webinar will be on March 22nd at 1 p.m. And Terry Nenich will be talking about managing um, salt in your soils. All right, thank you to everybody and hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. This was great information.